Hello, I'm Tom Zellabor, CEO of the Space Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Space Foundation Presents, our webinar series that showcases the missions and leaders that are pioneering new opportunities here on Earth, in orbit and beyond. Today's program will focus on the next giant leap we'll be taking to the red planet Mars. There could not be a better day to hear from our very special guests about this new adventure. Exactly 51 years ago today, the world watched NASA astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin take humanity's first small steps on a world that was not our home. 51 years later, we have three nations, the UAE, China, and the United States all taking their own giant leaps to Mars with multiple spacecraft. And by the way, congratulations to the UAE for their successful launch yesterday. While this is a source of great national pride for each of these nations, globally, we can celebrate what humanity can learn and achieve when we invest in people, curiosity, and pursue bold, challenging frontiers. At Space Foundation, that is part of our mission. We are looking forward to bringing the world's space community together again at the 36th Space Symposium this coming October 31st through November 2nd, both in person in Colorado Springs and virtually. We are also doing our part through our Center for Innovation and Education to drive, to drive diverse workforce development and economic opportunity so everyone can find their place in the growing space economy. At no other time in our history have we seen anything like what is unfolding with these three unique missions to Mars. Each of them is a science and engineering marvel, but today we want to specifically call out the NASA and JPL team for building another remarkable rover, the Perseverance, that will kick up even more dust on the red planet but also for building the aptly named Ingenuity Mars helicopter, the first aircraft to attempt controlled flight on another planet. And let me personally add from this retired naval aviator, to those who will fly Ingenuity over the landscape of Mars, your flights and performance really will change the universe, and we can't wait to see what we learn from this. The missions of Perseverance and Ingenuity along with Mars-bound spacecraft from the UAE and China, could not be happening at a more important time. As the world continues to fight COVID-19, missions like those going to Mars give us hope and inspiration for the days to come. The mission teams behind this new round of visitors to Mars have certainly done their part to adapt to this difficult environment and lead by example. So to each of those team members at NASA, JPL, the UTL, ULA Atlas team, and the UAE Space Agency and the China National Space Administration, on behalf of the Space Foundation and the global space community, thank you for your courage and character and showing us all that pioneering never stops. Today's webinar is part of our ongoing series called Space Foundation Presents, which is co-sponsored by Boeing. It's another example of our mission to bring you, the pioneering leaders that are making our universe more accessible to everyone, and we are grateful to Boeing for their support. To make sure you can be part of today's conversation, we are taking questions via Twitter using hashtag AskSF. And with that, it's time to begin our program. Joining us today is the Honorable Jim Bridenstine, NASA Administrator, and like me, another proud Naval Aviator. He is also a former member of the U.S. House of Representatives, having been elected to serve the First District of Oklahoma three times. Also part of today's prog program is Dr. Thomas Zerbukin, NASA Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate. We also have Dr. Michael Watkins, Director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and finally, Ms. Mimi Young, who is the project manager for the Ingenuity Mars helicopter out of NASA JPL. It's an honor to have them join us today. Now, before I turn the program over to Thomas Dormy, 
Space Foundation Vice President of Washington Operations to moderate the discussion, we have a short video highlighting NASA's effort. It clearly shows that despite the challenge, NASA continues to inspire a nation and future generations of exploration. The video is appropriately titled, We Persevere. We are a species of explorers, believers. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We are willing to do the hard things to overcome the many challenges. This is what brings out the best in us. We are go for a mission to the moon. Our path has led to success and to bitter losses. We come together today to mourn the loss of seven brave Americans. Yet, even when faced with tragedy and setbacks, we persevere. We keep striving. We keep believing. From space, we see our planet as a whole. We see the challenges facing it, and we face those challenges together. We will not give up. We challenge convention. We refuse to accept the status quo. The time at hand is hard, but we will persevere. We can still draw hope from the moon and the stars, from space, from exploration. There is a new day beyond the challenges we face now. Curiosity, insight, spirit, opportunity. If you think about it, all of these names of past Mars rovers are qualities we possess as humans. Ten, nine, we have ignition sequence start. But if rovers are to be the qualities of us as a race, we missed the most important thing. Three, two, perseverance. Launch, commit, liftoff. We have liftoff. We are a species of explorers. We will meet many obstacles on our way to Mars. But as humans, we'll not give up. We will always persevere. Wow, that was an inspiring video. Hello, I'm Thomas Stormy with the Space Foundation. It's my privilege to moderate today's event and our live discussion with NASA leadership. I want to invite the NASA team to join me on our virtual stage. And in order, if I could ask Mr. Jim Bridenstine, the NASA Administrator, Thomas Zerbukin, the Associate Administrator for NASA's Science Mission Directorate, Michael Watkins, Director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and Mimi Ong, the Ingenuity Helicopter Project Manager, to join me. First, as we get started, Administrator Bridenstine, I want to thank you and your team for joining us here today. And I have to say that was truly an incredible and inspiring video. Well, thank you. And I just want to say thank you to the Space Foundation. Um, <clears throat> this is a relationship that, that I've had with your organization that goes back to my days in the House of Representatives um, and the great scholarly work and the studies and, of course, um, the committees are putting together as it relates to space and um, it, it, it really has been a, a real pleasure uh, working with the Space Foundation for all of these years and of course uh, as the head of the head of NASA now it's uh, it's a relationship that I see uh, continuing long into the future so thank you for your great work and thank you for hosting this uh, and, and, and thank you and, and we do have a great strong relationship and look forward to keeping that going in the future so we're, uh, we're going to begin with some opening comments from NASA, followed by a, a question and answer session. As a quick note for those that have joined us and are watching live, feel free to join the conversation and ask a question using our hashtag AskSF. So now let's begin, and I think we're going to start with some comments from Dr. Zerbukin. So Thomas. Hey, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with uh, the team. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to congratulate uh, the United Arab Emirates for their successful launch of the HOPE mission to Mars, along with uh, their Japanese launch partners. That's a truly amazing accomplishment, and we're happy to join them soon with Perseverance, because together, HOPE and Perseverance are essential ingredients of exploration. 
it's truly an exciting decade ahead of us as the entire world sends missions to Mars to study and explore the red planet. Next week, the United States returns to Mars. It's the next step in putting together a puzzle we've been working on for centuries, which has accelerated in the last 55 years, beginning with the first flyby of Mars by Mariner 4. The world's eyes were opened when the Viking landers sent back transformative pictures of the surface of another planet for the first time. And the world got to see for itself the color Mars red with its own eyes. And we saw how it resembled our great American desertscapes. And we wondered anew what our two planets might have in common. Where all the ingredients necessary to life, carbon, other elements, water, energy, were they present on Mars and had the zoo produced microbes as it did on Earth? But did unhappy celestial occurrences for the neighbors snuff out that agent's life uh, as we strive here on flourish here on Earth as life is an important part of our planet? These are questions scientists have pondered for decades and more. So now we send Perseverance, the most capable robotic scientist ever sent to the surface of another planet, to the most promising place we could determine from here that could have supported life, an ancient river delta by what might once have been a huge lake. The Perseverance rover builds on the legacy of NASA's Mars exploration program and joins a fleet that right now includes a rover, a lander and multiple orbiters. It's our ninth mission to land and our fifth rover. Perseverance is our first mission to have astrobiology. In this case, the search for ancient life as part of its top line science goals. That current fleet of Mars, including the rover's uh, planet uh, made Curiosity, which is still roving five years in, and all the missions we have sent historically, these other missions have all found things that led us to keep going down this path, having found organics, methane, signs of water in the past, and even now, Perseverance suites of instruments will take the next step. Perseverance is also the bridge between science and human exploration that demonstrates how the two can support and reinforce each other. It will do incredible things until human scientists with their own unique perspectives and ability to make science judgments are able to walk the surface. I look forward to that personally, many of us do. And it advances a set of tools that have to have on the surface of Mars. Well, 55 years ago, we got a quick image as the spacecraft rushed by. Now we can contemplate evaluating samples and collecting them and bring them back to Earth. So what will Perseverance do? The planet's story is told in parts through its climate and META will tell us more about the weather on Mars and the prevalence of dust and how it affects human missions. RIMFAX will probe beneath the surface, perhaps finding ice deposits human missions could use. SuperCam and MassCam will survey and study the environment and turn amazing images. Basically, Perseverance will bring all human senses to Mars, will sense the air around it, see and scan the horizon, hear the planet with microphones on the surface for the first time, feel it as it picks up samples and to cash, perhaps even taste it in a sense as pixel and other instruments sample the chemistry and the rocks and soil around it. As humans prepare for the greatest adventure uh, here in in-person exploration of Mars, our robots can help. Moxie will help demonstrate how we might live off the land by converting carbon dioxide into oxygen that we can breathe or for rocket fuel. Sherlock, in addition to searching for organics, uses spacesuit material for calibration, which will also help us learn uh, how it degrades on Mars. And technologies such as Medley and Terrain Relative Navigation, TRN, will help us uh, help our rover to the surface and also provide data that is important to landing future human missions on Mars. Jim is going to talk a lot about this and this important context of human exploration as well. A helicopter named Ingenuity will demonstrate powered flight on another planet for the first time. I really look forward to seeing this 
Martian Wright Brothers moment. Uh, Mimi will tell us more about this. I'm just so excited about it. And Perseverance is going to prepare for humanity as long last to hold a piece of Mars uh, in our hand, not just a meteorite from somewhere, but a piece of an actual surface with its geologic context analyzed with the best instruments there for us to study back on Earth with the instruments as uh, the best instruments humanity has available to themselves, not only today, but also in the future. This is the first leg of the humanity's first ever round trip to another planet. And this amazing explorer could not have been ready for launch in this transient window we have without the perseverance of teams across the country and the world who struggled and sacrificed through the global pandemic to keep their sights on the, this milestone of humanity. Their work and this mission embody the agencies and our nation spirit of persevering even in the most challenging of situations, providing inspiration and advancing science and exploration. And the mission itself personifies the human ideal of persevering towards the future. Mike is gonna tell us more about this especially. Perseverance carries our hopes and dreams, the names of 11 million people from across the world who sent in their names to go with us under the black, we read Explore as one. I just wanna tell you, both of my parents who are no longer with us, their names are there. That is really meaningful to me from that perspective, as well as also my family who's here, who's all of their names are on, these, on this list. And Perseverance carries the goodwill of the entire space community that we and other nations all send missions to Mars this decade. It reinforces NASA's commitment to working with our international partners to accomplish stunning achievements in science, technology, and exploration. So when Perseverance, when Perseverance launches, it takes us all. Every one of us will have a chance to learn from and be inspired by this mission. Anytime we attempt something that pushes us to the next threshold is a time to celebrate. It is a big moment, a milestone for humanity that we all share. We explore and discover together and together we persevere. And with that, Thomas, I'm sending it back to you. Hey, thanks, Thomas. Thanks. For that. That, that was a really great overview. And I think it, it framed the importance of, of not just this mission, but what NASA you know, is doing at large with the scientific explorations. Uh, now I'd like to in, invite uh, Dr. Watkins from JPL to make some comments. Uh, Mike, over to you. Okay, thank you, Thomas uh, and Thomas. Um, you know, exactly uh, uh, as uh, Thomas Zerbukin said, the, um, you know, the, the name Perseverance, to a certain extent, it means two things. It means our rover, that's the most capable rover ever sent to another planet. It also means the thousand team members, or even more than a thousand, that built Perseverance uh, and will operate it on the surface. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that team before we uh, talk more about the, uh, the, the machine. You know, to, 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 to make a mission like this be successful, to get it to the launch pad, to get it finished, to get it to Mars, it takes a lot of perseverance. It takes a lot of brilliant hard work in the best of times. And uh, I don't think any of us anticipated uh, this COVID pandemic. And right during the most busy time of the mission, so the time when we are working three shifts a day, 24 by seven, trying to finish up the final assembly, put the clean flight hardware on, do all the final testing and make sure that we are ready to go. That's right when we uh, were hit by the, by the pandemic. And so what, what we have done, of course, is, is pull out all the stops and making sure that our team stayed safe. So that means lots and lots of telework. So lots of folks staying at home, just like everyone watching, you know, trying to operate the test beds, trying to write software, trying to do lots of work um, from home. Um, and then when they're in the office, when they had to actually get in there and touch hardware and assemble hardware, uh, you know, lots of PPE, lots of social distancing, uh, and really, you know, lots of lots of mental stress. I think all of us uh, have experienced that. But uh, this team had it doubly. Uh, we have about 100 folks down uh, at the Cape, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, doing the final assembly. That's where uh, Perseverance is right now. Uh, and another several hundred uh, at JPL, uh, you know, working on the, on the final testing and in some cases, the final hardware that we shipped out to, uh, to KSC just recently. Uh, you know, those folks not only had to deal with, uh, you know, having a sometimes family at home and, and that kind of stress. In some cases, they were separated. Sometimes they, they had to uh, self-isolate or they had to be quarantined. Um, and they and they couldn't uh, you know have the normal de-stress behaviors, 
And so I, I really just cannot say enough about how incredible this team was. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it is a heroic effort, you know, in the best of times. And uh, this team really knuckled down uh, and completed this uh, really on schedule and, and we are ready to go. And, uh, and I will acknowledge, you know, not just the JPL team, but of course the ULA launch team, um, a lot of our instrument um, folks and, uh, uh, and the KSC team as well. So it's really a team effort. Um, I'll also say that uh, the NASA, NASA as an agency really came together as a family, you know, we were to, in terms of transporting uh, people, transporting critical hardware out. Um, and uh, really it's just been a, 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 a surprisingly smooth experience given all the troubles with, uh, with COVID. Um, and so, you know, here we are basically at the pad, uh, ready to go. And so, uh, you know, we intend to launch at the end of July and uh, we will get to Mars uh, in February. Now, when we get to Mars, we're headed for a landing spot, Jezero Crater. Now, the scientists have poured over every image of Mars we have from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and, and uh, characterizations from the CRISM instrument and others in terms of what is the best site on Mars that had ancient habitability, we believe had ancient habitability. We learned a lot from Curiosity at Gale Crater, um, but also can preserve signs of that habitability, maybe signs of biosignatures if they existed. And so the scientists selected a Jezero crater. It is in fact a crater on Mars. It has a river delta in it. Uh, it looks just like a river delta that you'd find on, uh, you know, somewhere on planet Earth, uh, but it dried up about three billion years ago. So we are looking for ancient biosignatures. We're looking for the best spots on Mars. It's a clay rich environment where th these signs could have both formed and then been preserved. But of course, when we land, even with our great landing system and with our terrain relative navigation, we touch down somewhere in, in our landing zone, our landing ellipse, we call it. Um, and then our scientists have to find the very best spots, right? They've got to find those gems, you know, those uh, pots of gold that are there that represent this critical habitable environment and, and possible biosignatures as well. And that is where the, the mission again becomes a human and machine mission together. It becomes a partnership between robotics and humans. So, you know, we've talked about the complexity of perseverance and how that helps us understand how to send humans to Mars later. It helps us understand the, the, the long delay in communications, helps us understand navigation, helps us understand landing systems, helps us understand in situ resource utilization. So all of these help us understand how to send humans to Mars. But even with our robot there, we still have humans on Mars. Uh, because as Thomas said, it's really, it's our eyes and our ears, right? So we have the world's best team of planetary scientists, of Mars experts, and they direct that rover. And personally, having worked on Curiosity, having led the surface team uh, for Curiosity, I think the most fantastic thing about these missions is that you land on a new Mars, and then almost every day, it's another new Mars, right? Every day you drive a few hundred meters and you look around and you see something fascinating. And we actually release those photos to the public as soon as we get them. So when you get up in the morning and you click, uh, you know, on the uh, on the Mars website, on the Perseverance website, you'll see the pictures about the same time that the scientists do. And it is just fascinating to see, you know, wh wh where are we and what's the best place to go. And our scientists actually then interact with the rover engineers, with the instrument teams, and they actually decide, you know, that place over there, that looks like something I've seen on the Earth, and that that had a microbial mat. Or that's an area that, that I've seen on the earth, ancient preserved organics. So let's go over there and let's sample it. And we have a fantastic set of instrumentation. We can detect organics uh, very strongly uh, with some of our instruments. We can, uh, we can use x-rays, we can use ultraviolet, we can use a whole range of things um, besides cameras uh, to, to really hone in on, on whether these are the right sites. And then when they are the right sites, of course, we have this fantastic coring machine that goes in, collects a sample of that rock, seals it up in a tube, and later we're gonna go bring it back. And that's, as Thomas said, that's, our, that's the first step in our round trip for Mars sample return. So really this mission, we're out there trying to find something we've never found before on another planet, and then we're trying to capture it and isolate it and bring those samples back to take a close look at them, much like they do with the moon rocks. Because we don't really land on Mars that often, so this is, you know, we, we've done it eight times. This is our ninth, uh, hopefully be our ninth successful landing. Uh, we use these advantages on the surface to also test out new technologies. 
right? We want to keep pushing the envelope forward of what we are capable uh, of on the planet Mars. And so in this case, we carry a couple of technical demonstration experiments, and uh, Mimi Ong is going to uh, tell us a little bit more about that. So Thomas, let me kick it, kick it back to you. Yeah, Mike, and thanks for that. I mean, you really highlight the complexity, but not, but also the, the team effort from start to finish, not just now, but once we land on the planet. And it's, it's really great to hear how the public can follow along through that whole process. So that's, that's amazing. So yeah, let's, let's hear from uh, Ms. Ung, who is leading the effort with the BARS Ingenuity helicopter. Mimi, over to you. Hi, yes. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's really exciting to be here. Um, and um, as Mike mentioned, uh, there are three technologies being demonstrated on Mars 2020. The terrain relative navigation for safer landing in hazardous terrain, MOXIE, which converts uh, carbon dioxide to oxygen, for in-situ resource utilization and the Mars helicopter. So NASA performs technology demonstrations, tech demos to demonstrate advanced capabilities for spacecraft for future missions. The Mars helicopter tech demo will be the first ever um, the tech demo to attempt a rotorcraft flight at Mars. In fact, um, as mentioned earlier before, we as human beings have never flown a rotorcraft, a helicopter on anywhere outside of uh, our own Earth's atmosphere. So really a right spreader moment, but on another planet. So for NASA, the Mars technology demonstration, Mars helicopter tech demo is motivated by the potential to add the aerial dimension to space exploration. For example, at Mars, today we explore Mars uh, from spacecraft in orbit and rovers roving on the surface. In the future, there'll be astronauts on the surface. And the helicopter uh, can serve as scout for rovers and astronauts. Helicopter can also allow us to reach places that are simply not accessible today uh, without being able to fly. So uh, yet a tech demo on Mars helicopters never done before. Why? <laughs> it's not easy to build a rotorcraft to fly at Mars. So the atmosphere is really thin. I mean, compared to Earth's, it's about 1%. So a vehicle to fly in Mars has to be uh, really light and it has to you know, spin really fast. So for this technology demonstration on the Mars 2020 opportunity, the helicopter we've built is named Ingenuity. And Ingenuity has a rotor system that's 1.2 meter in diameter and the entire vehicle has to weigh under two kilograms. That's about four pounds. So to build this vehicle that weighs about four pounds, have, while having the capability to fly and land autonomously and to survive and operate autonomously at Mars, right? Remotely operated from Earth. That's a huge challenge. It's a tiny package with tons of um, capability packed. So to build this, there is a significant team uh, behind this team. And I wish really our team, I'm here to represent our team. I wish everybody on our team could be here to share the stories. We really have so many, uh, everyone from different disciplines involving from the fundamental mathematical equations to mechanical, electrical, software, um, you know, thermal, uh, avionics, materials and processes, and even the special test equipment and facilities that it takes to build and test something for the very first time. So it, everybody in each of our discipline really had to reach out, out of the box, excel in our own discipline, and really work truly as a team. All to pack all of this into this 1.8 kilogram, uh, four pound uh, limit. And the day our vehicle weighed in, it weighed in a hair under 1.8 kilogram, that was a huge day for us. So since then, uh, we've performed the helicopter test flights, in a simulated Mars atmosphere uh, in the 25 foot diameter space simulator chamber here at JPL. Uh, we've performed uh, test flights and compared the flight performance to the mathematical models that we started the design with originally. Uh, we've tested the vehicle in simulated uh, thermal environment, dynamics environment. Uh, we have tested it uh, with Perseverance rover. And very importantly, Perseverance has tested deploying us from the belly pan of the Perseverance rover 
successfully to the surface. So at this point, uh, we performed all the tests that we can on Earth. And the next step really is now to do it in the real environment this Mars Helicopter Ingenuity is designed for. In space vacuum, as soon as after launch, and finally on the surface of Mars. So at this very moment, Ingenuity is accommodated on Perseverance rover, waiting for the upcoming launch. And after Perseverance rover lands on the surface and has done the rover checkout, the rover will deploy the helicopter to the surface of Mars. And from then, we have a 30 Martian day window to do our flight experiments. So we have up to five flight plans to be performed in that time period. And the first and foremost, the most important flight for us, for our team, is the very first flight where we'll repeat the flight that we have tested multiple times in our test chamber here on Earth. So doing that in situ at Earth, on Earth, the um, in situ at Mars, in the Mars environment, will confirm the algorithms, the tests that we've performed on Earth. So, and then after getting that first flight, then we will be performing uh, more bolder and bolder flights of higher heights and further distances. So here we are, exciting days ahead. Helicopter is about to be launched. Uh, our team is thrilled. It's truly the high risk, high reward phase of our project. High risk because every step forward, starting from launch, every event that we have will be a first time event, right? First in space vacuum and then in the environment of Mars. But more importantly, high reward because uh, you know, our algorithms and the tests that we have done on Earth and really then, uh, you know, operating in situ and learning from how to operate the very first rotorcraft vehicle in space from Earth. All of that experiences will be feeding into future, much more capable rotorcraft uh, that we envision, you know, and really add that aerial dimension to space exploration. And for our team, that is the ultimate reward uh, that we've worked really, really, really hard for. So along that lines, uh, while I have the opportunity to be in the same virtual room with you, with you, Jim, Thomas, Mike, I really want to take this opportunity on the behalf of our team for having been there for your unwavering support through these past years on taking on this endeavor. Uh, it's been really important you know, for us to have that unwavering support as we took on this really high challenge. And so finally, also, uh, if I may, on a personal note, uh, I came to NASA inspired to, for the opportunity to contribute to space exploration. And along the way, I also fell in love with making first of a kind capabilities work for increasingly autonomous advanced space systems. And here today is an example of that dream come true. Here we are on a historical mission, perseverance, working on a tech demo, Mars Helicopter Ingenuity. Thank you so much. Mimi, thank you. And, and I can sense your enthusiasm, which you, you show for the whole team with this tech demo. That's amazing. And I, I think we're all excited uh, to help uh, or to watch and see Ingenuity take flight. So thank you very much. Thank you. Jim, such a tremendous team. I mean, a team of experts and, and certainly plenty of accomplishments along the way. Would, would you like to share some thoughts with uh, with our viewers? Uh, absolutely. And, and Mimi, uh, your enthusiasm is palpable. And I just want to say uh, to all the young people that might be watching today, Mimi is a shining example of the hope um, that, that, that NASA brings to the world. Um, think of a young girl who was growing up in Myanmar uh, during some really difficult times, who had a dream of one day coming to the United States and working for NASA. That is who Mimi Ung is, and now she is, she is leading a team that will, for the first time in humanity, fly a helicopter on another world. So I just want to say, um, this, is, this is a great, it's a, it, it really is, it's, it's your story, Mimi, is a story of perseverance. And this mission that is perseverance with ingenuity as the helicopter is, um, it, th this is emblematic of the greatness that comes from these kind of exploration initiatives. A couple of things that I want to highlight, and of course, everybody has said so much already, um, but I, I want you to think about for a second what we learned from two little rovers, spirit and opportunity. 
um, we learned from these two rovers years ago that the northern hemisphere of Mars was largely covered with water. Two thirds of the northern hemisphere of Mars was covered with water. We learned that that Mars at one time had a very thick atmosphere. And so it, it likely also had a magnetosphere that protected it from the radiation of deep space. In other words, Mars was at one time habitable. I'm not saying it was inhabited. Nobody knows. I don't know, neither does anybody else. But at one time, it had the ingredients necessary for having life even on its surface. And now we think about what we have learned because of curiosity and some of our international partners, we've learned that, that Mars has complex organic compounds on its surface, all over the surface. So the building blocks of life actually exist on the surface of Mars. They don't exist on the moon at all, but they're all over the surface. We have learned that the methane cycles of Mars actually match the seasons of Mars. So the probability of finding life on another world just went up again. And we have now discovered that what we believe to be liquid water 12 kilometers under the surface of Mars. What do we know about liquid water on Earth? Wherever it is, there is life. Is that true maybe on another planet? We don't know, but, but we need to go find out. And recently we have seen plumes of methane coming from Mars that increase the probability of finding life even more. These are very, very exciting times for a mission like Perseverance and like Ingenuity to help us make even more discoveries in this effort. And when we think about the Jezero Crater, which Mike talked about just a few minutes ago, yes, we believe at one time the, the Jezero Crater was a lake bed. But if you look at where we're going on the Jezero Crater, we're not just looking for a dry lake bed, we're looking at at, at, at what filled that lake bed. And what we have is we have a river that at one time flowed into the Jezero crater and a river delta that wh where there could be, again, I'm not saying there is, but there could be um, signatures of, of biology from an ancient past. These are the things that we need to look for. Um, and if we look at like, if we look at the rocks, the, the, the Mississippi River Delta, for example, we look at the rocks and the sediments, we can find biosignatures of ancient life. And can we take that, what we understand from our own planet and learn from, from Mars and make, um, make determinations as to whether or not there was or was not life there. Um, but, but I think more importantly is we're gonna cache samples. We're gonna go to those places where we believe have the, the highest scientific value. And we're actually gonna cache samples for a, a Mars return mission that we're going to do in 2026, where scientists, American scientists and scientists from around the world are going to be able to look at those samples and make very specific determinations about the history and the formation and, um, and the evolution of Mars and, and, and again, determine whether or not we believe there could have at one time been life on Mars. So these are such exciting times. But I also want to say, that all of these robotic precursor missions are leading up to something that I think is even more magnificent. And that is to a day when we plant an American flag on Mars. This is in the president's space policy directive one. He wants us to lead an effort to go to Mars. And he wants us to lead a, a coalition of international partners. And he wants us to go with commercial partners. He wants us to go to Mars in a way that, that we've never done well, obviously nobody's ever gone to Mars, certainly we've gone to the moon, but when we think about the moon to Mars program that NASA has initiated, we're going to the moon in a way that we've never done before with commercial and international partners, and we're doing it with a purpose. How do we live and work on another world for long periods of time so that we can go to Mars, where we will absolutely have to live for long periods of time in order to do what we need to do on the, on the surface of Mars? The moon is the proving ground, Mars is the destination. So with the moon program to Mars and the robotic precursors, all of this is leading to a day when, when we have humans living and working, not just on the moon, but on another planet, in this case, Mars. So the future is very bright. There's lots of opportunities. Um, NASA's budget is as high now as it's ever been in history in nominal dollars. The budget request now before the House and the Senate 
that takes it up even even more so than it is right now but it's intentional we are building what is necessary to make more discoveries learn more about our own solar system learn more about our own galaxy and universe than we've ever been able to know before um, so this is just a really really exciting time to be at the helm of this storied agency that is making history every day and this mission is yet another example of that history in the making. So Thomas, I'll turn it back over to you, but I'm certainly here for questions. And thank you, and, and thank, you, thank you all for those initial comments. So yeah, let's move into some questions and, and, and some discussion. And I'll, uh, we're getting some good feedback in from uh, our, our audience, so I'll, I'd like to try to get us through as many as I can. So uh, Jim, I wanna kind of start with it, kind of where you left us. I mean, it is this idea about uh, both NASA, what it's done historically, through JPL, um, NASA and its partners, uh, these inspirational endeavors. So in these times, why is it important to continue these exploration missions? I mean, you highlighted on some of the specifics of this mission, but how, how will this inspire a nation? And more importantly, how will it enable the next generation of, of Mars exploration? Yeah, I know it's important. You know, there was a seventh grader and you guys had him in the video at the beginning. Alex Mather, who's the one who named the Perseverance rover. And I think it was, a, it was a perfect name at the time. And of course, it's more important today than it even was when, when Thomas Zerbukin came to me and said, hey, here's, here's what we wanna do. We wanna name it Perseverance. We've got the seventh graders names, Alex Mather, and he wants to name it this, and we think it's the right, it's the right name. And of course, at the time I said, sounds great to me, let's do it. And that was before before the coronavirus pandemic broke out, which of course has um, wreaked a lot of havoc and of course it's made everything challenging for everybody. But again, the Perseverance mission is about persevering. Um, and when we think about, you know, we think about a seventh grader that named it, we think about probably a fifth grader, a fourth grader, who are the people that are gonna be inspired by these monumental achievements? And, and what is it that they're going to do and become? Like, how are they going to live their lives? This is about inspiration. Um, and, and it's about bringing the nations of the world together in a, in a very meaningful way at a time when, you know, there's a, lot of, there's, a, there's a lot of geopolitical challenges in the world. And yet space exploration brings people together in a way that I think is inspirational in and of itself. Um, and I would also say that, you know, there are some very specific challenges when it comes to Mars where we have, a, we have a short window of opportunity every 26 months uh, to launch something to Mars. And, and if we didn't move forward with Perseverance, um, you know, our Perseverance rover would go into storage for the next two years. And of course, that entails a whole host of risks in itself. Um, and of course, it costs you know, half a billion dollars. So there's a lot of reasons to move forward with this mission. I will tell you, when I look at what Mike Watkins and his team at JPL have done, when I look at what Tori Bruno and his team at United Launch Alliance, what they have done, Thomas Zerbukin and his team at NASA, um, we, we have done everything in our power to make working as safe as you would be if you were at home. Whether it's you know dividing up the shifts, whether it's uh, the personal protective equipment, um, you know all of these things, social distancing that we have to do. Um, in order to keep this mission on track, we have done, and we've done it with great su success. So I just wanna say thank you to the team that has enabled it to happen. But I do believe without question, uh, we do need to persevere in these challenging times. Thanks, for that. I, it, it's funny, I mean, in light of everything going on, such an appropriate name, Perseverance, and, and, and really, and, and for those that have not had a chance to see Alex Mather's essay, I mean, it's just from a young man, that's a, that, you know, the young future leader, that's a, that's an amazing, amazing name. Um, yeah. Thomas, this is Mike Watkins. I wanted to just add one uh, thing in terms of inspiration. Um, you know, every after we land, that's the beginning of the mission. Right? We, all, we all celebrate that we landed, but really that's the beginning of this journey of discovery on Mars. And we share that with the public every day. So everybody can go in there, every school kid, you know, every person, can go and take a look at what's happening today with the rover, what new discovery was made today, and there are discoveries coming constantly. And to me, that's a fantastic way for folks to follow along and really get pulled into the space program and get pulled into, you know, sometimes we anthropomorphize our rovers, 
but there's also a fantastic human team working those. And I, I think really that's something that uh, that folks can just live along with the mission. It's unusual. Yeah, Mike, that's a, and that's a great note. I think we see it today. We've got such a large audience. I think we've got 2,000 people right now following on Twitter and NASA TV and a variety of things. So uh, people are certainly following along, and I'm sure they will. Let me, uh, similar question on, on kind of why now, but a little different angle. This, this question actually um, comes from our co-sponsor, uh, Boeing, who, who is sponsoring our series. Um, the question is, is, is with Curiosity and Insight still active on Mars, why send Perseverance now? Why, why is now the right time? And what are the benefits of returning with a new probe so soon? We, we kind of highlighted that, but uh, Thomas, I'll throw that over to you. Your thoughts on that question? So first of all, I do think it's the ideal time. Frankly, I, I'm, uh, you know, it would be, and you know, Mike may have a different opinion, and I invite him, uh, of course, but uh, but it would be have been very difficult to kind of imagine doing this 20 years ago, frankly, or even 10 years ago. Uh, the, the instruments that are currently there and are re uh, sitting on top of the rocket, together, of course, with uh, you know Mimi's treasure, you know uh, uh, ingenuity, right? Uh, it they're the best that we can do now. I really, uh, you know, and I think, uh, you know, together with the Academy's endorsement and encouragement, we are, we know this is the most important question we could address right now uh, going there. We're really lucky that Curiosity is there and is, is continuing to do amazing research. You know, don't think of those things as uh, missions that somehow step on each other's feet, right? Get off the Curiosity our mission is continuing to do amazing work, for example, focused on organics. Uh, there's a new work that uh, just recently came out. I know just recently being in, in touch with the, uh, with the mission team, there's new insights that are coming from there that are uh, also informing uh, what's going on with Perseverance. What is unique though about Perseverance and the reason we wanted to do it now is we're, we can't wait to get those samples back because we, the questions that we want to address now are really so much different than uh, the ones that 20 years ago we might have asked. Uh, the questions we want to address now, we'd like to have these samples in our labs now. But Mike, how would you have answered it? Uh, almost the same way. Uh, you know, I think I think it is clear. You know, we wanted to first understand the history of Mars. We wanted to follow the water. We wanted to find a habitable environment. We've done all of those things. Uh, so from the scientific perspective, it's about astrobiology now. It's about, you know, w these complex organics, what's their history? Can we find them preserved? Um, you know, can we find biosignatures? I mean, this is really the next step. I mean, it's the it's where we want to go. It's where the program's been building up to at this point, and that's recognized by the, by the Academy as well. I would add one other um, item beyond just the engineering uh, knowledge and maturity that we've gained through these missions, and that is that... Um, you know, we're, we're not alone on Mars. In fact, we rely heavily on uh, on orbiters to relay our communications. So we can get much high bandwidth. Our videos are these beautiful panoramas you see. Those all come back from the rover talking by a UHF, for example, to Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter or to MAVEN or to European missions. Um, and then those are relayed at high rate back, back to the Earth. And so actually going back and doing sample return while we have that infrastructure in place and we don't need to rebuild and replace that entire infrastructure uh, of, of comstats basically and and and, and of, of photographic reconnaissance satellites um, is another efficiency that i think uh, is really worth it to take advantage of that uh, really significant investment in building that that infrastructure both engineering and and even dollar budget wise and i, um, I would say uh, go, curiosity and perseverance uh look um, Mike and I were talking earlier. We think about the total landmass of Mars. It's equivalent to the total landmass of the world when you take away the oceans. Um, you know, imagine if you were to study Earth for the first time and you landed in in maybe northern Africa, and from that you made a determination as to what the rest of the Earth was like. You you would miss a whole lot of things. So um, so it is a big planet. There is a whole lot to learn. Um, and, and yes, these missions don't step on each other. They really do complement each other. And we're trying to trying to understand a whole lot more than just, you know, one footprint on a really big planet. So let me probe into that one a little bit. And and, and no offense to anybody, but Mimi, you seem your, your initiative seems to be getting the most uh, questions. So I'm going to, you know, Mike, both for you and Mimi, perhaps. So, uh, you know, JPL has long been a pioneer of, of space exploration and, and innovation. Um, so 
the question on Ingenuity Helicopter. Um, can you speak more of the challenges? That, so I'm, I'm actually going to kind of throw some of this out there that I get from the questions. You know, the challenges in the absence of atmosphere for aerodynamics guidance and control. And then the next question, kind of as a rapid fire, just to, to, to let you, fr you know, get this out there. You know, with less gravity and the possibility of extreme Martian wind, you know, um, are, are we able to overcome these challenges for UAV? And then the last thing um, as part of that is if, it, if the first five flights are successful, is there, will there be time, energy to be able to do some more? Okay, uh, I'll start it off. So definitely uh, the challenge, uh, first and foremost, is of course that lightweight, uh, you know, beating down that capability. And the way we addressed it is really removing all the traditional walls between the different disciplines that we tend to have in much larger you know, systems that we traditionally have. So we really had to learn to work together, starting from this aerodynamic challenge, you know, optimizing the lift, even the way the blade, how can we maximize the lift to how can we build that blade that is still light? It has to be very light, but it has to be strong enough. It has to be able to spin enough. And all the walls between aerodynamics and uh, GNNC and uh, the power, the thermal, the structure, all of that really had to go away because we were really forced because of this mass constraint. So that's the very first you know, answer is that it really has been an extremely, it's an engineer's uh, engineering project, a dream engineering project <laughs> to say. Um, and then in terms of the atmosphere, we worked with the uh, scientists uh, away from the, from the very beginning in terms of understanding the atmospheric densities and the winds. And we did take the scientists' uh, knowledge of the Martian uh, winds and built the helicopter, the response rates of the you know, blade control systems and all of that are uh, size to exceed with margin the expected level of winds that we expect. So um, to add to that, in parallel to inventing this first helicopter to fly you know so light and so capable and we talked about autonomous it has to survive autonomously and you know be able to keep itself warm and that capability um, we also had to uh, invent in parallel the test system we've never you know built an aerial vehicle for uh, for mars and so parallel to inventing the helicopter was parallel a uh, parallel system to invent the entire test system how do you, you know, after building the vehicle, it's not like we take it to a chamber and say, now let's fly it, right? We really had to incrementally check all the assumptions that we made in our models and carefully check it off. So there was that invention. And then there's the third leg that we don't talk as much about, which we should hear, is how to get it to Mars. You know, the Perseverance rover team did an incredible job accommodating. Now that it's all working, it looks easy. There it is sitting on the belly pan, but the Helicopter is one of the most tedious things uh, to accommodate on the on the rover, and the rover team put us in a really nice location on the belly pan. And to minimize protrusion below the belly pan, you know, the two teams work together, the rover team and the helicopter team. We figured out how to put it on the side on the helicopter. We had to adjust, you know, some of the features, and there it is, accommodated and able to deploy. So, quite a lot of innovation all in one uh, effort. So um, thank you for that. And, and I noticed that that's a that's a copy of the ingenuity behind you. Uh, 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 right. Full scale. Yeah, exciting. Yes. So um, we've got a little bit of time left, and I, I want to get to a few other questions. So, um, Administrator, this is kind of more directed to you. Um, you know, China and the UAE are also sending spacecrafts to the Red Planet this month, and what we noted earlier, UAE's successful launch of the Hope Orbiter uh, earlier or yesterday. Um, what are the opportunities for NASA to collaborate on, on these type of initiatives? I know you're heavily partnered on, on a lot of others, but how can we how can we uh, collaborate with the national partners for Mars exploration or other places beyond that? Yeah, that's a, it's an important question, and and we do that quite frequently um, throughout all of our programs. And as as a matter of fact, we have right now over 700 agreements um, with, between NASA and, and other space agencies throughout the world um, and even other countries that don't have space agencies yet. <laughs> we encourage everybody to get a space agency because we want them to, to be able to partner with us on 
on our big missions. But um, but we NASA is a great tool of diplomacy. Um, it's a great tool of bringing nations together. You know, here in just a few short months in November, we're going to celebrate 20 years of American astronauts and Russian cosmonauts living and working together in space on the International Space Station. And of course, while that's that's 20 years uh, working together on that project, you know, going back to 1975, we had the the shuttle Mir or yeah, the shuttle Mir program in the 80s. We had um, the uh, Apollo Soyuz program in the 70s. So this is not new. Um, and you know, we like to think that you know NASA um, and space exploration it kind of transcends it transcends politics. Republicans and Democrats in the United States, everybody loves space exploration. Uh, it transcends geopolitics. Um, and so I think this is really a, a great opportunity for collaboration. And of course, we do have many international partners on the on 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 um, perseverance here. So it's a, it's a very exciting time. So so if I could someone ask a, a follow up on that, I mean, um, you make some very persuasive arguments for what NASA deserves. Uh, and, and, and the support, and it resonates across a large variety of people. So Courtney from Maryland sends this in. So, um, you know, so cl clearly this re resonates with space nerds like me, but what, what and how will you persuade your former colleagues in Congress who are facing large deficits exacerbated by COVID-related stimulus packages? And is there something that the private sector can do more to help augment your efforts? 100%. And it's, again, these are all important points. We think about um, what NASA has enabled um, throughout its history. Um, we, we think about how do we communicate? A lot of people are going to watch this because they have internet broadband from space. Or if you're watching on NASA TV, you might have Dish Network or Direct TV. Um, these are all space-based communication capabilities that were born from this little agency called NASA that was innovating at a level that well was well beyond what anybody believed was even possible back in those days. But the way we do communications, um, over the horizon communications, XM radio, for example, um, we, we talk about how we navigate GPS technology developed by NASA, of course now uh, operated by the Department of Defense. But, but again, um, the way we predict weather, um, the way we, um, the way we do disaster relief and a lot of the national security capabilities of the nation um, the way we access space in general for a whole host of commercial remote sensing capabilities. Um, there, th there are so many things that NASA has contributed to on the economic side. We, we think about the, 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 you know, we're talking about Mars, right? Well, the camera in your cell phone was, was created because of a mission requirement that NASA had to create a really small camera when we explore Mars. That's just one of so many examples, but we, we think about the improvement of the human condition because of what NASA has been able to achieve. Um, you know, right now, it, you know, we're talking about JPL. They have a, a number of impressive missions. Um, the GRACE follow-on mission, which is helping us understand where the drought is in the world, and um, EcoStress, which is enabling us to understand, you know, can we increase crop yields while reducing water usage at the same time? feeding more of the world than ever before with less water usage. These are missions that NASA can do that nobody else you know, in the world is doing. Um, so look, we are every day improving the human condition in ways that are absolutely immeasurable. And I'll tell you, as the NASA administrator, here's what I hear about. I hear about Tang and I hear about Velcro, which <laughs> were two things that we quite frankly didn't invent, but you know, we used back in the Apollo era. Um, but I'll tell you, it goes so far beyond that. Uh, if you're looking for a return on investment, there is nothing, nothing better that the American government could invest in than NASA. And that's what's happening right now with bipartisan support. So it's really a good, a good place to be right now. That's, that's great to hear. I have to apologize. We're really at the balance of our time. I, I do have to ask before we go, you know, commercial crew launched, uh, you know, just over a month ago, another historic thing. How are Bob and Doug doing and, and how long till they return back to Earth on Dragon? So Bob and Doug are doing fantastic. Um, you know, three spacewalks. Uh, Bob Benkin and Chris Cassidy have done three spacewalks. Of course, Doug has been inside the International Space Station supporting that. 
uh, from the inside. Um, and now we've got one more spacewalk to go. Um, and then they're going to be focused uh, like a laser on coming home. And right now we're targeting a date of, of August 2nd for a return. But again, that's going to be based on a lot of conditions to include weather and sea states um, and, and, and other things. So um, yeah, we're, we're targeting early August. Uh, but so far that mission has gone very, very well, better than expected. And I'm knocking on wood because it is not over until Bob and Doug are home. So um, we're in good shape there. So I, I apologize, we are over time. Um, real quick, uh, uh, Administrator Brightside, any final thoughts before we sign off? Sure, thank you. And again, thank you to the Space Foundation and thank you to Boeing for hosting this. Um, I just wanna say, you know, this mission that we're about to launch is historic in and of itself, uh, but what it's building towards is something even bigger. Um, we're going to Mars as, as humanity, with international partners, with commercial partners. The first step to do that is we have to learn how to live and work on another world, and it just so happens that we have this moon that's a three-day journey away. We learned in the Apollo program, Apollo 13 specifically, that things can go very wrong on the way to the moon and we can still make it home. Things could go wrong on the surface of the moon and we can still make it home. When we send humans to Mars, we have to make sure that we've got it, we've, we've got the architecture established, that we've got the systems proven. So we're going to the moon to learn how to work on another, live and work on another world so that we can get to Mars. And right now we're doing these robotic missions to Mars so that when our humans do go to Mars, we know where to go, we know what to do, we have the, the absolute best locations picked out where we're going to be able to maximize the utility of the science. So all of this works together. One of the things you know I've been working on ever since I've been the NASA administrator is wherever there's division, we need to drive it out. People used to say, well, it's either the moon or it's Mars. It is not true. We can do both and we need to do both. People used to say, well, it's either human exploration or robotic exploration. It is not true. They, we need to do both. They work together side by side. So um, there's a lot of opportunity and, and bringing everybody together is what's going to enable it to happen. And again, we've got right now we've got strong bipartisan support. We're working every day to grow that. And anything people out there can do to help is what makes these programs sustainable. We need to think not just in terms of you know, administrations. We need to think in terms of generations. We need long-term sustainable programs that can go from one generation to the next. And if we do that, we will, in fact, be on the surface of the Mars in the not too distant future with humans. So thank you, thank you, Jim, thanks for that. And thanks for the inspiration that all of you bring. Uh, and thank you for joining us here today. This has been a great discussion and an honor to host you on our Space Foundation Presents series. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank everyone for tuning in today, especially those that were participating using our hashtag AskSF. I also want to recognize our co-sponsor Boeing for their great support and for all their amazing initiatives across the space industry. Uh, as a reminder, this event will be posted online for later viewing at spacefoundation.org. Again, thank you for joining us. From all of us here at the Space Foundation, stay healthy and have a great day.